Book One, Part One of Herodotus's Histories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Graham Redman. Histories, Volume One by Herodotus of Halicarnassus, translated by A. D. Godley. Book One, Part One, Paragraphs One to Fifteen. This is the display of the inquiry of Herodotus of Halicarnassus, so that things done by man not be forgotten in time, and that great and marvellous deeds, some displayed by the Hellenes, some by the barbarians, not lose their glory, including among others what was the cause of their waging war on each other. The Persian learned men say that the Phoenicians were the cause of the dispute. These, they say, came to our seas from the sea which is called Red, and having settled in the country which they still occupy, at once began to make long voyages. Among other places to which they carried Egyptian and Assyrian merchandise, they came to Argos, which was at that time preeminent in every way among the people of what is now called Hellas. The Phoenicians came to Argos and set out their cargo, on the fifth or sixth day after their arrival, when their wares were almost all sold, many women came to the shore, and among them especially the daughter of the king, whose name was Io, according to Persians and Greeks alike, the daughter of Inachus. As these stood about the stern of the ship bargaining for the wares they liked, the Phoenicians incited one another to set upon them. Most of the women escaped, Io and others were seized and thrown into the ship, which then sailed away for Egypt. In this way, the Persians say, and not as the Greeks, was how Io came to Egypt, and this, according to them, was the first wrong that was done. Next, according to their story, some Greeks, they cannot say who, landed at Tyre in Phoenicia, and carried off the king's daughter Europa, these Greeks must, I suppose, have been Cretans. So far, then, the account between them was balanced. But after this, they say, it was the Greeks who were guilty of the second wrong. They sailed in a long ship to Aia, a city of the Colchians, and to the river Phasis. And when they had done the business for which they came, they carried off the king's daughter Medea. When the Colchian king sent a herald to demand reparation for the robbery and restitution of his daughter, the Greeks replied that, as they had been refused reparation for the abduction of the Argive Io, they would not make any to the Colchians. Then, they say, in the second generation after this, Alexandrus, son of Priam, who had heard this tale, decided to get himself a wife from Hellas by capture, for he was confident that he would not suffer punishment. So he carried off Helen. The Greeks first resolved to send messengers demanding that Helen be restored and atonement made for the seizure. But when this proposal was made, the Trojans pleaded the seizure of Medea and reminded the Greeks that they asked reparation from others, yet made none themselves, nor gave up the booty when asked. So far it was a matter of mere seizure on both sides. But after this, the Persians say, the Greeks were very much to blame, for they invaded Asia before the Persians attacked Europe. We think, they say, that it is unjust to carry women off, but to be anxious to avenge rape is foolish. Wise men take no notice of such things for plainly the women would never have been carried away had they not wanted it themselves. We of Asia did not deign to notice the seizure of our women, but the Greeks, for the sake of a Lacedaemonian woman, recruited a great armada, came to Asia, and destroyed the power of Priam. Ever since then we have regarded Greeks as our enemies. For the Persians claim Asia for their own and the foreign peoples that inhabit it. Europe and the Greek people, they consider to be separate from them. Such is the Persian account. In their opinion, it was the taking of Troy which began their hatred of the Greeks. 
but the Phoenicians do not tell the same story about Io as the Persians. They say that they did not carry her off to Egypt by force. She had intercourse in Argos with the captain of the ship. Then, finding herself pregnant, she was ashamed to have her parents know it, and so, lest they discover her condition, she sailed away with the Phoenicians of her own accord. These are the stories of the Persians and the Phoenicians. For my part, I shall not say that this or that story is true, but I shall identify the one who I myself know did the Greeks' unjust deeds, and thus proceed with my history, and speak of small and great cities of men alike. For many states that were once great have now become small, and those that were great in my time were small before. Knowing therefore that human prosperity never continues in the same place, I shall mention both alike. Croesus was a Lydian by birth, son of Aliates, and sovereign of all the nations west of the river Halys, which flows from the south between Syria and Paphlagonia, and empties into the sea called Euxine. This Croesus was the first foreigner whom we know who subjugated some Greeks and took tribute from them, and won the friendship of others, the former being the Ionians, the Aeolians, and the Dorians of Asia, and the latter the Lacedaemonians. Before the reign of Croesus all Greeks were free, for the Cimmerian host which invaded Ionia before his time did not subjugate the cities, but raided and robbed them. Now the sovereign power that belonged to the descendants of Heracles fell to the family of Croesus, called the Myrmnidae, in the following way. Candoles, whom the Greeks call Merciless, was the ruler of Sardis. He was descended from Alcaeus, son of Heracles. Agron, son of Ninus, son of Belus, son of Alcaeus, was the first Heraclid king of Sardis, and Candoles, son of Mercus, was the last. The kings of this country, before Agron, were descendants of Lydus, son of Attis, from whom this whole Lydian district got its name. Before that it was called the land of the Mii. The Heraclidae, descendants of Heracles and a female slave of Iardanus, received the sovereignty from these and held it because of an oracle. And they reigned for twenty-two generations, or five hundred and five years, son succeeding father, down to Candoles, son of Mercus. This Candoles then fell in love with his own wife, so much that he believed her to be by far the most beautiful woman in the world, and believing this he praised her beauty beyond measure to Gyges, son of Dasylus, who was his favourite among his bodyguard, for it was to Gyges that he entrusted all his most important secrets. After a little while Candoles, doomed to misfortune, spoke to Gyges thus, Gyges, I do not think that you believe what I say about the beauty of my wife. Men trust their ears less than their eyes, so you must see her naked. Gyges protested loudly at this. Master, he said, what an unsound suggestion that I should see my mistress naked. When a woman's clothes come off, she dispenses with her modesty too. Men have long ago made wise rules from which one ought to learn. One of these is that one should mind one's own business. As for me, I believe that your queen is the most beautiful of all women, and I ask you not to ask of me what is lawless. Speaking thus, Gyges resisted, for he was afraid that some evil would come of it for him. But this was Candoles' answer. Courage, Gyges! Do not be afraid of me, that I say this to test you, or of my wife, that you will have any harm from her. I will arrange it so that she shall never know that you have seen her. I will bring you into the chamber where she and I lie, and conceal you behind the open door. And after I have entered, my wife too will come to bed. There is a chair standing near the entrance of the room. On this she will lay each article of her clothing as she takes it off, and you will be able to look upon her at your leisure. Then, when she moves from the chair to the bed, turning her back on you, be careful she does not see you going out through the doorway. 
As Gyges could not escape, he consented. Candoles, when he judged it to be time for bed, brought Gyges into the chamber. His wife followed presently, and when she had come in and was laying aside her garments, Gyges saw her. When she turned her back upon him to go to bed, he slipped from the room. The woman glimpsed him as he went out, and perceived what her husband had done. But though shamed, she did not cry out or let it be seen that she had perceived anything, for she meant to punish Candoles, since among the Lydians and most of the foreign peoples it is felt as a great shame that even a man be seen naked. For the present she made no sign and kept quiet. But as soon as it was day she prepared those of her household whom she saw were most faithful to her, and called Gyges. He, supposing that she knew nothing of what had been done, answered the summons, for he was used to attending the queen whenever she summoned him. When Gyges came, the lady addressed him thus, Now, Gyges, you have two ways before you. Decide which you will follow. You must either kill Candoles and take me and the throne of Lydia for your own, or be killed yourself now without more ado. That will prevent you from obeying all Candoles' commands in the future and seeing what you should not see. One of you must die, either he, the contriver of this plot, or you, who have outraged all custom by looking on me uncovered. Gyges stood a while, astonished at this. Presently he begged her not to compel him to such a choice. But when he could not deter her, and saw that dire necessity was truly upon him either to kill his master or himself be killed by others, he chose his own life. Then he asked, Since you force me against my will to kill my master, I would like to know how we are to lay our hands on him. She replied, You shall come at him from the same place where he made you view me naked. Attack him in his sleep. When they had prepared this plot and night had fallen, Gyges followed the woman into the chamber, for Gyges was not released, nor was there any means of deliverance, but either he or Candoles must die. She gave him a dagger, and hid him behind the same door, and presently he stole out and killed Candoles as he slept. Thus he made himself master of the king's wife and sovereignty. He is mentioned in the iambic verses of Archilochus of Paris, who lived about the same time. So he took possession of the sovereign power, and was confirmed in it by the Delphic oracle. For when the Lydians took exception to what was done to Candoles, and took up arms, the faction of Gyges came to an agreement with the rest of the people, that if the oracle should ordain him king of the Lydians, then he would reign, but if not, then he would return the kingship to the Heraclidae. The oracle did so ordain, and Gyges thus became king. However, the Pythian priestess declared that the Heraclidae would have vengeance on Gyges' posterity in the fifth generation, an utterance to which the Lydians and their kings paid no regard until it was fulfilled. Thus the Myrmnidae robbed the Heraclidae of the sovereignty and took it for themselves. Having gotten it, Gyges sent many offerings to Delphi. There are very many silver offerings of his there, and besides the silver he dedicated a hoard of gold, among which six golden bowls are the offerings especially worthy of mention. These weigh thirty talents, and stand in the treasury of the Corinthians, although in truth it is not the treasury of the Corinthian people, but of Sypsilus, son of Eetion. This Gyges, then, was the first foreigner whom we know, who placed offerings at Delphi after the king of Phrygia, Midas, son of Gordias. For Midas too made an offering, namely the royal seat on which he sat to give judgment, and a marvellous seat it is. It is set in the same place as the bowls of Gyges. This gold, and the silver offered by Gyges, is called by the Delphians Gygean, after its dedicator. As soon as Gyges came to the throne, he too, like others, led an army into the lands of Miletus and Smyrna, 
and he took the city of Colophon. But as he did nothing else great in his reign of thirty-eight years, I shall say no more of him, and shall speak instead of Ardis, son of Gyges, who succeeded him. He took Priene and invaded the country of Miletus, and it was while he was monarch of Sardis that the Cimmerians, driven from their homes by the nomad Scythians, came into Asia and took Sardis, all but the Acropolis. End of Book One, Part One Recording by Graham Redman Book One, Part Two of Herodotus Histories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Graham Redman. Histories, Volume One by Herodotus of Halicarnassus, translated by A. D. Godley. Book One, Part Two. Paragraphs 16 to 36. Ardis reigned for forty-nine years, and was succeeded by his son Sadiates, who reigned for twelve years, and after Sadiates came Aliates, who waged war against Deoces's descendant Cyaxes and the Medes, drove the Cimmerians out of Asia, took Smyrna, which was a colony from Colophon, and invaded the lands of Cladzomini. But he did not return from these as he wished, but with great disaster. Of other deeds done by him in his reign, these were the most notable. He continued the war against the Milesians which his father had begun. This was how he attacked and besieged Miletus. He sent his army, marching to the sound of pipes and harps and bass and treble flutes, to invade when the crops in the land were ripe. And whenever he came to the Milesian territory, he neither demolished nor burnt nor tore the doors off the country dwellings, but let them stand unharmed. But he destroyed the trees and the crops of the land, and so returned to where he came from. For as the Milesians had command of the sea, it was of no use for his army to besiege their city. The reason that the Lydian did not destroy the houses was this, that the Milesians might have homes from which to plant and cultivate their land, and that there might be the fruit of their toil for his invading army to lay waste. He waged war in this way for eleven years, and in these years two great disasters overtook the Milesians, one at the Battle of Limoneon in their own territory, and the other in the valley of the Meander. For six of these eleven years, Sadiates, son of Ardis, was still ruler of Lydia, and it was he who invaded the lands of Miletus, for it was he who had begun the war. For the following five the war was waged by Sadiates's son, Aliates, who, as I have indicated before, inherited the war from his father and carried it on vigorously. None of the Ionians helped to lighten this war for the Milesians except the Chians. These lent their aid in return for a similar service done for them for the Milesians had previously helped the Chians in their war against the Erythraeans. In the twelfth year, when the Lydian army was burning the crops, the fire set in the crops, blown by a strong wind, caught the temple of Athena, called Athena of Assisus, and the temple burned to the ground. For the present no notice was taken of this, but after the army had returned to Sardis, Aliates fell ill, and as his sickness lasted longer than it should, he sent to Delphi to inquire of the oracle, either at someone's urging, or by his own wish to question the god about his sickness. But when the messengers came to Delphi, the Pythian priestess would not answer them before they restored the temple of Athena at Assisos in the Milesian territory, which they had burnt. I know this much to be so, because the Delphians told me. 
The Milesians add that Periander, son of Cypsilus, a close friend of the Thrasybulus who was then sovereign of Miletus, learned what reply the oracle had given to Aleates, and sent a messenger to tell Thrasybulus, so that his friend, forewarned, could make his plans accordingly. The Milesians say it happened so. Then, when the Delphic reply was brought to Aleates, he promptly sent a herald to Miletus, offering to make a truce with Thrasybulus and the Milesians during his rebuilding of the temple. So the envoy went to Miletus. But Thrasybulus, forewarned of the whole matter, and knowing what Aleates meant to do, devised the following plan. He brought together into the marketplace all the food in the city, from private stores and his own, and told the men of Miletus all to drink and celebrate together when he gave the word. Thrasybulus did this so that when the herald from Sardis saw a great heap of food piled up and the citizens celebrating, he would bring word of it to Aleates. And so it happened. The herald saw all this, gave Thrasybulus the message he had been instructed by the Lydian to deliver, and returned to Sardis. And this, as I learn, was the sole reason for the reconciliation. For Aleates had supposed that there was great scarcity in Miletus, and that the people were reduced to the last extremity of misery. But now on his herald's return from the town he heard an account contrary to his expectations. So presently the Lydians and Milesians ended the war, and agreed to be friends and allies, and Aleates built not one, but two temples of Athena at Assisus, and recovered from his illness. That is the story of Aleates' war against Thrasybulus and the Milesians. Periander, who disclosed the oracle's answer to Thrasybulus, was the son of Cypsilus and sovereign of Corinth. The Corinthians say, and the lesbians agree, that the most marvellous thing that happened to him in his life was the landing on Tenerus of Orion of Methymna brought there by a dolphin. This Orion was a lyre-player second to none in that age. He was the first man whom we know to compose and name the dithyram, which he afterwards taught at Corinth. They say that this Orion, who spent most of his time with Periander, wished to sail to Italy and Sicily, and that after he had made a lot of money there, he wanted to come back to Corinth. Trusting none more than the Corinthians, he hired a Corinthian vessel to carry him from Tarentum. But when they were out at sea, the crew plotted to take Orion's money and cast him overboard. Discovering this, he earnestly entreated them, asking for his life and offering them his money. But the crew would not listen to him, and told him either to kill himself and so receive burial on land, or else to jump into the sea at once. Abandoned to this extremity, Orion asked that, since they had made up their minds, they would let him stand on the half-deck in all his regalia and sing and he promised that after he had sung, he would do himself in. The men, pleased at the thought of hearing the best singer in the world, drew away toward the waist of the vessel from the stern. Arion, putting on all his regalia and taking his lyre, stood up on the half-deck and sang the stirring song. And when the song was finished, he threw himself into the sea as he was with all his regalia. So the crew sailed away to Corinth. But a dolphin, so the story goes, took Orion on his back and bore him to Tenerus. Landing there, he went to Corinth in his regalia, and when he arrived he related all that had happened. Periander, sceptical, kept him in confinement, letting him go nowhere, and waited for the sailors. When they arrived, they were summoned and asked what news they brought of Orion. When they were saying that he was safe in Italy, and that they had left him flourishing at Tarentum, Orion appeared before them, 
just as he was when he jumped from the ship. Astonished, they could no longer deny what was proved against them. This is what the Corinthians and Lesbians say, and there is a little bronze memorial of Orion on Tinarus, the figure of a man riding upon a dolphin. Aliates the Lydian, his war with the Milesians finished, died after a reign of fifty-seven years. He was the second of his family to make an offering to Delphi, after recovering from his illness, of a great silver bowl on a stand of welded iron. Among all the offerings at Delphi, this is the most worth seeing, and is the work of Glaucus the Chian, the only one of all men who discovered how to weld iron. After the death of Aliates, his son Croesus, then thirty-five years of age, came to the throne. The first Greeks whom he attacked were the Ephesians. These, besieged by him, dedicated their city to Artemis. They did this by attaching a rope to the city wall from the temple of the goddess, which stood seven stades away from the ancient city which was then besieged. These were the first whom Croesus attacked. Afterwards he made war on the Ionian and Aeolian cities in turn, upon different pretexts. He found graver charges where he could, but sometimes alleged very petty grounds of offence. Then, when he had subjugated all the Asiatic Greeks of the mainland, and made them tributary to him, he planned to build ships and attack the islanders. But when his preparations for shipbuilding were under way, either Bias of Priene or Pittacus of Mytilene, the story is told of both, came to Sardis and, asked by Croesus for news about Hellas, put an end to the shipbuilding by giving the following answer. O king, the islanders are buying ten thousand horse, intending to march to Sardis against you. Croesus, thinking that he spoke the truth, said, would that the gods would put this in the heads of the islanders to come on horseback against the sons of the Lydians. Then the other answered and said, O king, you appear to me earnestly to wish to catch the islanders riding horses on the mainland, a natural wish. And what else do you suppose the islanders wished, as soon as they heard that you were building ships to attack them, than to catch Lydians on the seas, so as to be revenged on you for the Greeks who dwell on the mainland whom you enslaved. Croesus was quite pleased with this conclusion, for he thought the man spoke reasonably, and, heeding him, stopped building ships. Thus he made friends with the Ionians inhabiting the islands. As time went on, Croesus subjugated almost all the nations west of the Halys, for except the Cilicians and Lycians, all the rest Croesus held subject under him. These were the Lydians, Phrygians, Mysians, Mariandinians, Calibes, Paphlagonians, the Thracian Thinians and Bithynians, Carians, Ionians, Dorians, Aeolians, and Pamphylians, and after these were subdued and subject to Croesus in addition to the Lydians, all the sages from Hellas who were living at that time, coming in different ways, came to Sardis, which was at the height of its prosperity. And among them came Solon the Athenian, who after making laws for the Athenians at their request, went abroad for ten years, sailing forth to see the world, he said. This he did so as not to be compelled to repeal any of the laws he had made, since the Athenians themselves could not do that, for they were bound by solemn oaths to abide for ten years by whatever laws Solon should make. So, for that reason, and to see the world, Solon went to visit Amasis in Egypt, and then to Croesus in Sardis. When he got there, Croesus entertained him in the palace, and on the third or fourth day, Croesus told his attendants to show Solon around his treasures, and they pointed out all those things that were great and blessed. 
After Solon had seen everything and had thought about it, Croesus found the opportunity to say, My Athenian guest, we have heard a lot about you because of your wisdom and of your wanderings, how, as one who loves learning, you have travelled much of the world for the sake of seeing it. So now I desire to ask you, who is the most fortunate man you have seen? Croesus asked this question, believing that he was the most fortunate of men. But Solon, offering no flattery but keeping to the truth, said, O king, it is Tellus the Athenian. Croesus was amazed at what he had said, and replied sharply, In what way do you judge Tellus to be the most fortunate? Solon said, Tellus was from a prosperous city, and his children were good and noble. He saw children born to them all, and all of these survived. His life was prosperous by our standards, and his death was most glorious. When the Athenians were fighting their neighbours in Eleusis, he came to help, routed the enemy, and died very finely. The Athenians buried him at public expense on the spot where he fell, and gave him much honour. When Solon had provoked him by saying that the affairs of Tellus were so fortunate, Croesus asked who he thought was next, fully expecting to win second prize. Solon answered, Cleobis and Biton. They were of Argive's stock, had enough to live on, and on top of this had great bodily strength. Both had won prizes in the athletic contests, and this story is told about them. There was a festival of Hera in Argos, and their mother absolutely had to be conveyed to the temple by a team of oxen. But their oxen had not come back from the fields in time, so the youths took the yoke upon their own shoulders under constraint of time. They drew the wagon, with their mother riding atop it, travelling five miles until they arrived at the temple. When they had done this and had been seen by the entire gathering, their lives came to an excellent end, and in their case the god made clear that for human beings it is a better thing to die than to live. The Argive men stood around the youths and congratulated them on their strength. The Argive women congratulated their mother for having borne such children. She was overjoyed at the feat and at the praise, so she stood before the image and prayed that the goddess might grant the best thing for man to her children Cleobis and Bytone, who had given great honour to the goddess. After this prayer they sacrificed and feasted. The youths then lay down in the temple and went to sleep, and never rose again. Death held them there. The Argives made and dedicated at Delphi statues of them as being the best of men. Thus Solon granted second place in happiness to these men. Croesus was vexed and said, My Athenian guest, do you so much despise our happiness that you do not even make us worth as much as common men? Solon replied, Croesus, you ask me about human affairs, and I know that the divine is entirely grudging and troublesome to us. In a long span of time it is possible to see many things that you do not want to, and to suffer them too. I set the limit of a man's life at seventy years. These seventy years have twenty-five thousand two hundred days, leaving out the intercalary month. But if you make every other year longer by one month, so that the seasons agree opportunely, then there are thirty-five intercalary months during the seventy years, and from these months there are one thousand fifty days. Out of all these days in the seventy years, all twenty-six thousand two hundred and fifty of them, not one brings anything at all like another. So, Croesus, man is entirely chance. 
to me you seem to be very rich and to be king of many people but i cannot answer your question before i learn that you ended your life well the very rich man is not more fortunate than the man who has only his daily needs unless he chances to end his life with all well many very rich men are unfortunate many of moderate means are lucky the man who is very rich but unfortunate surpasses the lucky man in only two ways while the lucky surpasses the rich but unfortunate in many the rich man is more capable of fulfilling his appetites and of bearing a great disaster that falls upon him and it is in these ways that he surpasses the other the lucky man is not so able to support disaster or appetite as is the rich man but his luck keeps these things away from him and he is free from deformity and disease has no experience of evils and has fine children and good looks if besides all this he ends his life well then he is the one whom you seek the one worthy to be called fortunate but refrain from calling him fortunate before he dies call him lucky it is impossible for one who is only human to obtain all these things at the same time just as no land is self-sufficient in what it produces each country has one thing but lacks another whichever has the most is the best just so no human being is self-sufficient each person has one thing but lacks another whoever passes through life with the most and then dies agreeably is the one who in my opinion o king deserves to bear this name it is necessary to see how the end of every affair turns out for the god promises fortune to many people and then utterly ruins them by saying this solon did not at all please croesus who sent him away without regard for him but thinking him a great fool because he ignored the present good and told him to look to the end of every affair but after solon's departure divine retribution fell heavily on croesus as i guess because he supposed himself to be blessed beyond all other men directly as he slept he had a dream which showed him the truth of the evil things which were going to happen concerning his son he had two sons one of whom was ruined for he was mute but the other whose name was attis was by far the best in every way of all his peers the dream showed this attis to croesus how he would lose him struck and killed by a spear of iron so croesus after he awoke and considered being frightened by the dream brought in a wife for his son and although attis was accustomed to command the lydian armies croesus now would not send him out on any such enterprise while he took the javelins and spears and all such things that men use for war from the men's apartments and piled them in his storeroom lest one should fall on his son from where it hung now while croesus was occupied with the marriage of his son a phrygian of the royal house came to sardis in great distress and with unclean hands this man came to croesus house and asked to be purified according to the custom of the country so croesus purified him the lydians have the same manner of purification as the greeks and when he had done everything customary he asked the phrygian where he came from and who he was friend he said who are you and from what place in phrygia do you come as my suppliant and what man or woman have you killed o king the man answered i am the son of gordias the son of midas and my name is adrastus i killed my brother accidentally and i come here banished by my father and deprived of all croesus answered all of your family are my friends 
and you have come to friends, where you shall lack nothing staying in my house. As for your misfortune, bear it as lightly as possible, and you will gain most. So Adrastus lived in Croesus' house. About this same time a great monster of a boar appeared on the Mysian Olympus, who would come off that mountain and ravage the fields of the Mysians. The Mysians had gone up against him often, but they never did him any harm, but were hurt by him themselves. At last they sent messengers to Croesus with this message. O king, a great monster of a boar has appeared in the land, who is destroying our fields. For all our attempts we cannot kill him. So now we ask you to send your son and chosen young men and dogs with us, so that we may drive him out of the country. Such was their request. But Croesus remembered the prophecy of his dream and answered them thus, Do not mention my son again. I will not send him with you. He is newly married, and that is his present concern. But I will send chosen Lydians and all the huntsmen, and I will tell those who go to be as eager as possible to help you to drive the beast out of the country. End of Book One, Part Two Recording by Graham Redman Book One, Part Three of Herodotus Histories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Graham Redman. Histories, Volume One, by Herodotus of Halicarnassus, translated by A. D. Godley. Book One. Part Three, Paragraphs thirty seven to sixty two. This was his answer, and the Mysians were satisfied with it. But the son of Croesus now entered, having heard what the Mysians had asked for, and when Croesus refused to send his son with them, the young man said, Father, it was once thought very fine and noble for us to go to war and the chase and win renown, but now you have barred me from both of these, although you have seen neither cowardice nor lack of spirit in me. With what face can I now show myself whenever I go to and from the marketplace? What will the men of the city think of me, and what my newly wedded wife? With what kind of man will she think that she lives? So either let me go to the hunt, or show me by reasoning that what you are doing is best for me. My son, answered Croesus, I do this not because I have seen cowardice or anything unseemly in you, but the vision of a dream stood over me in my sleep, and told me that you would be short-lived, for you would be killed by a spear of iron. It is because of that vision that I hurried your marriage, and do not send you on any enterprise that I have in hand, but keep guard over you, so that perhaps I may rob death of you during my lifetime. You are my only son. For that other, since he is ruined, he doesn't exist for me. Father, the youth replied, no one can blame you for keeping guard over me when you have seen such a vision, but it is my right to show you what you do not perceive and why you mistake the meaning of the dream. You say that the dream told you that I should be killed by a spear of iron, but has a boar hands? Has it that iron spear which you dread? Had the dream said I should be killed by a tusk or some other thing proper to a boar, you would be right in acting as you act, but no, it was to be by a spear. Therefore, since it is not against men that we are to fight, let me go. Croesus answered, My son, your judgment concerning the dream has somewhat reassured me, and being reassured by you, I change my thinking, 
and permit you to go to the chase. Having said this, Croesus sent for Adrastus the Phrygian, and when he came, addressed him thus. Adrastus, when you were struck by ugly misfortune, for which I do not blame you, it was I who cleansed you, and received and still keep you in my house, defraying all your keep. Now then, as you owe me a return of good service for the good which I have done you, I ask that you watch over my son as he goes out to the chase. See that no thieving criminals meet you on the way to do you harm. Besides, it is only right that you too should go where you can win renown by your deeds. That is fitting for your father's son, and you are strong enough besides. O king, Adrastus answered, I would not otherwise have gone into such an arena. One so unfortunate as I should not associate with the prosperous among his peers, nor have I the wish so to do, and for many reasons I would have held back. But now, since you urge it, and I must please you, since I owe you a return of good service, I am ready to do this. And as for your son, in so far as I can protect him, look for him to come back unharmed. So when Adrastus had answered Croesus thus, they went out provided with chosen young men and dogs. When they came to Mount Olympus, they hunted for the beast, and, finding him, formed a circle and threw their spears at him. Then the guest called Adrastus, the man who had been cleansed of the deed of blood, missed the boar with his spear and hit the son of Croesus. So Attis was struck by the spear and fulfilled the prophecy of the dream. One ran to tell Croesus what had happened, and coming to Sardis told the king of the fight and the fate of his son. Distraught by the death of his son, Croesus cried out the more vehemently because the killer was one whom he himself had cleansed of blood, and in his great and terrible grief at this mischance, he called on Zeus by three names, Zeus the Purifier, Zeus of the Hearth, Zeus of Comrades, the first because he wanted the god to know what evil his guest had done him, the second, because he had received the guest into his house, and thus unwittingly entertained the murderer of his son, and the third, because he had found his worst enemy in the man whom he had sent as a protector. Soon the Lydians came, bearing the corpse, with the murderer following after. He then came and stood before the body, and gave himself up to Croesus, holding out his hands and telling him to kill him over the corpse, mentioning his former misfortune and that on top of that he had destroyed the one who purified him and that he was not fit to live. On hearing this, Croesus took pity on Adrastus, though his own sorrow was so great, and said to him, Friend, I have from you the entire penalty, since you sentence yourself to death. But it is not you that I hold the cause of this evil, except in so far as you were the unwilling doer of it, but one of the gods, the same one who told me long ago what was to be. So Croesus buried his own son in such manner as was fitting. But Adrastus, son of Gordias, who was son of Midas, this Adrastus, the destroyer of his own brother and of the man who purified him, when the tomb was undisturbed by the presence of men, killed himself there by the sepulchre, seeing clearly now that he was the most heavily afflicted of all whom he knew. After the loss of his son, Croesus remained in deep sorrow for two years. After this time, the destruction by Cyrus, son of Cambyses, of the sovereignty of Astyages, son of Cyaraxes, and the growth of the power of the Persians, distracted Croesus from his mourning, and he determined, if he could, 
to forestall the increase of the Persian power before they became great. Having thus determined, he at once made inquiries of the Greek and Libyan oracles, sending messengers separately to Delphi, to Abbey in Phocia, and to Dodona, while others were dispatched to Amphiarius and Strophonius, and others to Branchidae in the Milesian country. These are the Greek oracles to which Croesus sent for divination, and he told others to go inquire of Ammon in Libya. His intent in sending was to test the knowledge of the oracles, so that if they were found to know the truth, he might send again and ask if he should undertake an expedition against the Persians. And when he sent to test these shrines, he gave the Lydians these instructions. They were to keep track of the time from the day they left Sardis, and on the hundredth day inquire of the oracles what Croesus, king of Lydia, son of Aliates, was doing then. Then they were to write down whatever the oracles answered, and bring the reports back to him. Now none relate what answer was given by the rest of the oracles. But at Delphi, no sooner had the Lydians entered the hall to inquire of the god, and asked the question with which they were entrusted, than the Pythian priestess uttered the following hexameter verses. I know the number of the grains of sand and the extent of the sea, and understand the mute and hear the voiceless. The smell has come to my senses of a strong-shelled tortoise boiling in a cauldron together with a lamb's flesh, under which is bronze and over which is bronze. Having written down this inspired utterance of the Pythian priestess, the Lydians went back to Sardis. When the others as well, who had been sent to various places, came bringing their oracles, Croesus then unfolded and examined all the writings. Some of them in no way satisfied him, but when he read the Delphian message, he acknowledged it with worship and welcome, considering Delphi as the only true place of divination, because it had discovered what he himself had done. For after sending his envoys to the oracles, he had thought up something which no conjecture could discover, and carried it out on the appointed day. Namely, he had cut up a tortoise and a lamb, and then boiled them in a cauldron of bronze covered with a lid of the same. Such, then, was the answer from Delphi delivered to Croesus. As to the reply which the Lydians received from the oracle of Amphiarius, when they had followed the due custom of the temple, I cannot say what it was, for nothing is recorded of it, except that Croesus believed that from this oracle too he had obtained a true answer. After this he tried to win the favour of the Delphian god with great sacrifices. He offered up three thousand beasts from all the kinds fit for sacrifice, and on a great pyre burnt couches covered with gold and silver, golden goblets, and purple cloaks and tunics. By these means he hoped the better to win the aid of the god, to whom he also commanded that every Lydian sacrifice what he could. When the sacrifice was over, he melted down a vast store of gold, and made ingots of it, the longer sides of which were of six, and the shorter of three palms length, and the height was one palm. There were a hundred and seventeen of these. Four of them were of refined gold, each weighing two talents and a half. The rest were of gold with silver alloy, each of two talents weight. He also had a figure of a lion made of refined gold, weighing ten talents. When the temple of Delphi was burnt, this lion fell from the ingots which were the base on which it stood, and now it is in the treasury of the Corinthians, but weighs only six talents and a half, for the fire melted away three and a half talents. When these offerings were ready, Croesus sent them to Delphi, with other gifts besides, namely two very large bowls, one of gold and one of silver. 
the golden bowl stood to the right, the silver to the left of the temple entrance. These two were removed about the time of the temple's burning, and now the golden bowl, which weighs eight and a half talents and twelve minae, is in the treasury of the Cladzominians, and the silver bowl at the corner of the forecourt of the temple. This bowl holds six hundred nine-gallon measures, for the Delphians use it for a mixing bowl at the feast of the divine appearance. It is said by the Delphians to be the work of Theodorus of Samos, and I agree with them, for it seems to me to be of no common workmanship. Moreover, Croesus sent four silver casks, which stand in the treasury of the Corinthians, and dedicated two sprinkling vessels, one of gold, one of silver. The golden vessel bears the inscription given by the Lacedaemonians, who claim it as their offering. But they are wrong, for this too is Croesus' gift. The inscription was made by a certain Delphian, whose name I know but do not mention, out of his desire to please the Lacedaemonians. The figure of a boy through whose hand the water runs is indeed a Lacedaemonian gift, but they did not give either of the sprinkling vessels. Along with these Croesus sent, besides many other offerings of no great distinction, certain round basins of silver, and a female figure five feet high, which the Delphians assert to be the statue of the woman who was Croesus Baker. Moreover, he dedicated his own wife's necklaces and girdles. Such were the gifts which he sent to Delphi. To Amphiarius, of whose courage and fate he had heard, he dedicated a shield made entirely of gold, and a spear all of solid gold, point and shaft alike. Both of these were, until my time, at Thebes, in the Theban temple of Ismenian Apollo. The Lydians who were to bring these gifts to the temples were instructed by Croesus to inquire of the oracles whether he was to send an army against the Persians, and whether he was to add an army of allies. When the Lydians came to the places where they were sent, they presented the offerings and inquired of the oracles in these words. Croesus, king of Lydia and other nations, believing that here are the only true places of divination among men, endows you with such gifts as your wisdom deserves. And now he asks you whether he is to send an army against the Persians, and whether he is to add an army of allies. Such was their inquiry, and the judgment given to Croesus by each of the two oracles was the same, namely that if he should send an army against the Persians, he would destroy a great empire. And they advised him to discover the mightiest of the Greeks, and make them his friends. When the divine answers had been brought back, and Croesus learned of them, he was very pleased with the oracles. So, altogether expecting that he would destroy the kingdom of Cyrus, he sent once again to Pytho and endowed the Delphians, whose number he had learned, with two gold staters apiece. The Delphians, in return, gave Croesus and all Lydians the right of first consulting the oracle, exemption from all charges, the chief seats at festivals, and perpetual right of Delphian citizenship to whoever should wish it. After his gifts to the Delphians, Croesus made a third inquiry of the oracle, for he wanted to use it to the full, having received true answers from it, and the question which he asked was whether his sovereignty would be of long duration. To this the Pythian priestess answered as follows, when the Medes have a mule as king, just then, tender-footed Lydian, by the stone-strewn Hermus, flee and do not stay, and do not be ashamed to be a coward. When he heard these verses, Croesus was pleased with them above all, for he thought that a mule would never be king of the Medes instead of a man, and therefore that he and his posterity would never lose his empire. Then he sought, very carefully, to discover who the mightiest of the Greeks were, 
whom he should make his friends. He found by inquiry that the chief peoples were the Lacedaemonians among those of Doric, and the Athenians among those of Ionic stock. These races, Ionian and Dorian, were the foremost in ancient time, the first a Pelasgian and the second a Hellenic people. The Pelasgian race has never yet left its home. The Hellenic has wandered often and far. For in the days of King Deucalion it inhabited the land of Thea. Then the country called Histiaean under Ossa and Olympus in the time of Dorus, son of Helene. Driven from this Histiaean country by the Cadmians, it settled about Pindus in the territory called Macedonian. From there again it migrated to Dryopia, and at last came from Dryopia into the Peloponnese, where it took the name of Dorian. What language the Pelasgians spoke I cannot say definitely, but if one may judge by those that still remain of the Pelasgians who live above the Tyrrhenae in the city of Crestone, who were once neighbours of the people now called Dorians, and at that time inhabited the country which now is called Thessalian, and of the Pelasgians who inhabited Placia and Silesi on the Hellespont, who came to live among the Athenians, and by other towns too which were once Pelasgian and afterwards took a different name, if, as I said, one may judge by these, the Pelasgians spoke a language which was not Greek. If, then, all the Pelasgian stock spoke so, then the Attic nation, being of Pelasgian blood, must have changed its language too at the time when it became part of the Hellenes. For the people of Creston and Placia have a language of their own in common, which is not the language of their neighbours, and it is plain that they still preserve the manner of speech which they brought with them in their migration into the places where they live. But the Hellenic stock, it seems clear to me, has always had the same language since its beginning, yet being, when separated from the Pelasgians, few in number, they have grown from a small beginning to comprise a multitude of nations, chiefly because the Pelasgians and many other foreign peoples united themselves with them. Before that, I think, the Pelasgic stock nowhere increased much in number while it was of foreign speech. Now of these two peoples, Croesus learned that the Attic was held in subjection and divided into factions by Pisistratus, son of Hippocrates, who at that time was sovereign over the Athenians. This Hippocrates was still a private man when a great marvel happened to him when he was at Olympia to see the games. When he had offered the sacrifice, the vessels, standing there full of meat and water, boiled without fire, until they boiled over. Chilon, the Lacedaemonian, who happened to be there and who saw this marvel, advised Hippocrates not to take to his house a wife who could bear children, but if he had one already, then to send her away, and if he had a son, to disown him. Hippocrates refused to follow the advice of Chilon, and afterward there was born to him this Pisistratus, who, when there was a feud between the Athenians of the coast under Megacles, son of Alcmion, and the Athenians of the plain under Lycurgus, son of Aristoleides, raised up a third faction as he coveted the sovereign power. He collected partisans and pretended to champion the uplanders, and the following was his plan. Wounding himself and his mules, he drove his wagon into the marketplace, with a story that he had escaped from his enemies, who would have killed him, so he said, as he was driving into the country. So he implored the people to give him a guard, and indeed he had won a reputation in his command of the army against the Megarians, when he had taken Nicaea, and performed other great exploits. Taken in, the Athenian people gave him a guard of chosen citizens, whom Pisistratus made clubmen instead of spearmen, for the retinue that followed him carried wooden clubs. 
these rose with Pisistratus and took the Acropolis, and Pisistratus ruled the Athenians, disturbing in no way the order of offices nor changing the laws, but governing the city according to its established constitution, and arranging all things fairly and well. But after a short time the partisans of Megacles and of Lycurgus made common cause and drove him out. In this way Pisistratus first got Athens, and, as he had a sovereignty that was not yet firmly rooted, lost it. Presently his enemies, who together had driven him out, began to feud once more. Then Megacles, harassed by factional strife, sent a message to Pisistratus offering him his daughter to marry, and the sovereign power besides. When this offer was accepted by Pisistratus, who agreed on these terms with Megacles, they devised a plan to bring Pisistratus back, which, to my mind, was so exceptionally foolish, that it is strange, since from old times the Hellenic stock has always been distinguished from foreign by its greater cleverness and its freedom from silly foolishness, that these men should devise such a plan to deceive Athenians, said to be the subtlest of the Greeks. There was in the Paeanian deem a woman called Fire, three fingers short of six feet four inches in height, and otherwise too well formed. This woman they equipped in full armour and put in a chariot, giving her all the paraphernalia to make the most impressive spectacle, and so drove into the city. Heralds ran before them, and when they came into town proclaimed as they were instructed, Athenians, give a hearty welcome to Pisistratus, whom Athena herself honours above all men, and is bringing back to her own Acropolis. So the heralds went about proclaiming this, and immediately the report spread in the deems that Athena was bringing Pisistratus back, and the townsfolk, believing that the woman was the goddess herself, worshipped this human creature, and welcomed Pisistratus. Having got back his sovereignty in the manner which I have described, Pisistratus married Megacles' daughter according to his agreement with Megacles. But as he already had young sons, and as the Alcmeonid family was said to be under a curse, he had no wish that his newly wedded wife bear him children, and therefore had unusual intercourse with her. At first the woman hid the fact. Presently she told her mother, whether interrogated or not I do not know, and the mother told her husband. Megacles was very angry to be dishonoured by Pisistratus, and in his anger he patched up his quarrel with the other faction. Pisistratus, learning what was going on, went alone away from the country altogether, and came to Eretria, where he deliberated with his sons. The opinion of Hippias prevailing that they should recover the sovereignty, they set out collecting contributions from all the cities that owed them anything. Many of these gave great amounts, the Thebans more than any, and in course of time, not to make a long story, everything was ready for their return, for they brought Argive mercenaries from the Peloponnese, and there joined them on his own initiative a man of Naxos called Ligdemis, who was most keen in their cause, and brought them money and men. So after ten years they set out from Eretria and returned home. The first place in Attica which they took and held was Marathon, and while encamped there they were joined by their partisans from the city, and by others who flocked to them from the country, deemsmen who loved the rule of one more than freedom. These then assembled, but the Athenians in the city, who, while Pisistratus was collecting money, and afterwards, when he had taken Marathon, took no notice of it, did now, and when they learned that he was marching from Marathon against Athens, they set out to attack him. They came out with all their force to meet the returning exiles. 
Pisistratus' men encountered the enemy when they had reached the temple of Pelenian Athena in their march from Marathon towards the city, and encamped face to face with them. There, by the providence of heaven, Pisistratus met Amphilitus the Acarnanian, a diviner, who came to him and prophesied as follows in hexameter verses, The cast is made, the net spread. The tunny fish shall flash in the moonlit night. End of Book One, Part Three Recording by Graham Redman Book One, Part Four of Herodotus Histories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Graham Redman. Histories, Volume One, by Herodotus of Halicarnassus, translated by A. D. Godley. Book One, Part Four, Paragraph Sixty Three to Seventy Eight. So Amphilitus spoke, being inspired. Pisistratus understood him, and, saying that he accepted the prophecy, led his army against the enemy. The Athenians of the city had by this time had breakfast, and after breakfast some were dicing and some were sleeping. They were attacked by Pisistratus' men and put to flight. So they fled, and Pisistratus devised a very subtle plan to keep them scattered and prevent them assembling again. He had his sons mount and ride forward. They overtook the fugitives and spoke to them as they were instructed by Pisistratus, telling them to take heart and each to depart to his home. The Athenians did, and by this means Pisistratus gained Athens for the third time, rooting his sovereignty in a strong guard and revenue collected both from Athens and from the district of the river Strymon, and he took hostage the sons of the Athenians who remained and did not leave the city at once, and placed these in Naxos. He had conquered Naxos too, and put Lygdemis in charge. And besides this, he purified the island of Delos as a result of oracles. And this is how he did it. He removed all the dead that were buried in ground within sight of the temple, and conveyed them to another part of Delos. So Pisistratus was sovereign of Athens, and as for the Athenians, some had fallen in the battle, and some, with the Alcmeonids, were exiles from their native land. So Croesus learned that at that time such problems were oppressing the Athenians, but that the Lacedaemonians had escaped from the great evils, and had mastered the Tegeans in war. In the kingship of Leon and Hegesicles at Sparta, the Lacedaemonians were successful in all their other wars, but met disaster only against the Tegeans. Before this they had been the worst governed of nearly all the Hellenes, and had had no dealings with strangers, but they changed to good government in this way. Lycurgus, a man of reputation among the Spartans, went to the oracle at Delphi. As soon as he entered the hall, the priestess said in hexameter, "'You have come to my rich temple, Lycurgus, a man dear to Zeus and to all who have Olympian homes. I am in doubt whether to pronounce you man or god, but I think rather you are a god, Lycurgus. Some say that the Pythia also declared to him the constitution that now exists at Sparta, but the Lacedaemonians themselves say that Lycurgus brought it from Crete when he was guardian of his nephew Leobotes, the Spartan king. Once he became guardian, he changed all the laws and took care that no one transgressed the new ones. Lycurgus afterwards established their affairs of war, 
the sworn divisions, the bands of thirty, the common meals, also the ephors and the council of elders. Thus they changed their bad laws to good ones, and when Lycurgus died they built him a temple, and now worship him greatly. Since they had good land and many men, they immediately flourished and prospered. They were not content to live in peace, but, confident that they were stronger than the Arcadians, asked the oracle at Delphi about gaining all the Arcadian land. She replied in hexameter, You ask me for Arcadia? You ask too much, I grant it not. There are many men in Arcadia, eaters of acorns, who will hinder you. But I grudge you not. I will give you Tegea to beat with your feet in dancing, and its fair plain to measure with a rope. When the Lacedaemonians heard the oracle reported, they left the other Arcadians alone, and marched on to Gia carrying chains, relying on the deceptive oracle. They were confident they would enslave the Tegeans, but they were defeated in battle. Those taken alive were bound in the very chains they had brought with them, and they measured the Tegean plain with a rope by working the fields. The chains in which they were bound were still preserved in my day, hanging up at the temple of Athena Alea. In the previous war the Lacedaemonians continually fought unsuccessfully against the Tegeans, but in the time of Croesus and the kingship of Anaxandrides and Ariston in Lacedaemon, the Spartans had gained the upper hand. This is how. When they kept being defeated by the Tegeans, they sent ambassadors to Delphi to ask which god they should propitiate to prevail against the Tegeans in war. The Pythia responded that they should bring back the bones of Orestes, son of Agamemnon. When they were unable to discover Orestes' tomb, they sent once more to the god to ask where he was buried. The Pythia responded in hexameter to the messengers, There is a place, Tegea, in the smooth plain of Arcadia, where two winds blow under strong compulsion. Blow lies upon blow, woe upon woe. There the life-giving earth covers the son of Agamemnon. Bring him back, and you shall be lord of Tegea. When the Lacedaemonians heard this, they were no closer to discovery, though they looked everywhere. Finally it was found by Lycas, who was one of the Spartans who are called doers of good deeds. These men are those citizens who retire from the knights, the five oldest each year. They have to spend the year in which they retire from the knights, being sent here and there by the Spartan state, never resting in their efforts. It was Lycas, one of these men, who found the tomb in Tegea by a combination of luck and skill. At that time there was free access to Tegea, so he went into a blacksmith's shop and watched iron being forged, standing there in amazement at what he saw done. The smith perceived that he was amazed, so he stopped what he was doing and said, my Laconian guest, if you had seen what I saw, then you would really be amazed, since you marvel so at iron-working. I wanted to dig a well in the courtyard here, and in my digging I hit upon a coffin twelve feet long. I could not believe that there had ever been men taller than now, so I opened it and saw that the corpse was just as long as the coffin. I measured it, and then reburied it. So the smith told what he had seen, and Lycas thought about what was said, and reckoned that this was Orestes, according to the oracle. In the smith's two bellows he found the winds, hammer and anvil were blow upon blow, and the forging of iron was woe upon woe, since he figured that iron was discovered as an evil for the human race. After reasoning this out, 
he went back to Sparta and told the Lacedaemonians everything. They made a pretense of bringing a charge against him and banishing him. Coming to Tegea, he explained his misfortune to the smith and tried to rent the courtyard, but the smith did not want to lease it. Finally he persuaded him and set up residence there. He dug up the grave and collected the bones, then hurried off to Sparta with them. Ever since then the Spartans were far superior to the Tegeans whenever they met each other in battle. By the time of Croesus' inquiry, the Spartans had subdued most of the Peloponnese. Croesus then, aware of all this, sent messengers to Sparta with gifts to ask for an alliance, having instructed them what to say. They came and said, Croesus, king of Lydia and other nations, has sent us with this message. Lacedaemonians, the god has declared that I should make the Greek my friend. Now therefore, since I learn that you are the leaders of Hellas, I invite you as the oracle bids. I would like to be your friend and ally without deceit or guile. Croesus proposed this through his messengers, and the Lacedaemonians, who had already heard of the oracle given to Croesus, welcomed the coming of the Lydians and swore to be his friends and allies. And indeed they were obliged by certain benefits which they had received before from the king, for the Lacedaemonians had sent to Sardis to buy gold, intending to use it for the statue of Apollo which now stands on Thornax in Laconia. And Croesus, when they offered to buy it, made them a free gift of it. For this reason, and because he had chosen them as his friends before all the other Greeks, the Lacedaemonians accepted the alliance. So they declared themselves ready to serve him when he should require, and moreover they made a bowl of bronze, engraved around the rim outside with figures, and large enough to hold twenty-seven hundred gallons, and brought it with the intention of making a gift in return to Croesus. This bowl never reached Sardis, for which two reasons are given. The Lacedaemonians say that when the bowl was near Samos on its way to Sardis, the Samians descended upon them in warships and carried it off. But the Samians themselves say that the Lacedaemonians who were bringing the bowl, coming too late, and learning that Sardis and Croesus were taken, sold it in Samos to certain private men, who set it up in the temple of Hera. And it may be that the sellers of the bowl, when they returned to Sparta, said that they had been robbed of it by the Samians. Such are the tales about the bowl. Croesus, mistaking the meaning of the oracle, invaded Cappadocia, expecting to destroy Cyrus and the Persian power. But while he was preparing to march against the Persians, a certain Lydian, who was already held to be a wise man, and who, from the advice which he now gave, won a great name among the Lydians, advised him as follows. His name was Sandinus. O king! You are getting ready to march against men who wear trousers of leather, and whose complete wardrobe is of leather, and who eat not what they like, but what they have, for their land is stony. Further, they do not use wine, but drink water, have no figs to eat, or anything else that is good. Now if you conquer them, of what will you deprive them, since they have nothing? But if, on the other hand, you are conquered, then look how many good things you will lose. For once they have tasted of our blessings, they will cling so tightly to them that nothing will pry them away. For myself, then, I thank the gods that they do not put it in the heads of the Persians to march against the Lydians. Sandinus spoke thus, but he did not persuade Croesus. Indeed, before they conquered the Lydians, the Persians had no luxury and no comforts. Now the Cappadocians are called by the Greeks Syrians, 
and these Syrians before the Persian rule were subjects of the Medes, and at this time of Cyrus. For the boundary of the Median and Lydian empires was the river Hellas, which flows from the Armenian mountains first through Cilicia, and afterwards between the Mattiini on the right and the Phrygians on the other hand. Then, passing these and still flowing north, it separates the Cappadocian Syrians on the right from the Paphlagonians on the left. Thus the Halys River cuts off nearly the whole of the lower part of Asia from the Cyprian to the Euxine Sea. Here is the narrowest neck of all this land. The length of the journey across for a man travelling unencumbered is five days. The reasons for Croesus' expedition against Cappadocia were these. He desired to gain territory in addition to his own, and, these were the chief causes, he trusted the oracle and wished to avenge Astyages on Cyrus. For Cyrus, son of Cambyses, had conquered Astyages and held him in subjection. Now Astyages, son of Cyaraxes and the king of Media, was Croesus' brother-in-law, and this is how he came to be so. A tribe of wandering Scythians separated itself from the rest and escaped into Median territory. This was then ruled by Cyaraxes, son of Phraortes, son of Deioces. Cyaraxes at first treated the Scythians kindly as suppliants for his mercy, and as he had a high regard for them, he entrusted boys to their tutelage to be taught their language and the skill of archery. As time went on, it happened that the Scythians, who were accustomed to go hunting and always to bring something back, once had taken nothing, and when they returned empty-handed, Cyaraxes treated them very roughly and contemptuously, being, as appears from this, prone to anger. The Scythians, feeling themselves wronged by the treatment they had from Cyaraxes, planned to take one of the boys who were their pupils and cut him in pieces, then, dressing the flesh as they were accustomed to dress the animals which they killed, to bring and give it to Cyaraxes as if it were the spoils of the hunt, and after that to make their way with all speed to Aliates, son of Sadiates, at Sardis. All this they did. Cyaraxes and the guests who ate with him dined on the boy's flesh, and the Scythians, having done as they planned, fled to Aliates for protection. After this, since Aliates would not give up the Scythians to Cyaraxes at his demand, there was war between the Lydians and the Medes for five years. Each won many victories over the other, and once they fought a battle by night. They were still warring with equal success when it happened, at an encounter which occurred in the sixth year, that during the battle the day was suddenly turned to night. Thales of Miletus had foretold this loss of daylight to the Ionians, fixing it within the year in which the change did indeed happen. So when the Lydians and Medes saw the day turned to night, they stopped fighting, and both were the more eager to make peace. Those who reconciled them were Cyanesis the Cilician and Labinetus the Babylonian. They brought it about that there should be a sworn agreement and a compact of marriage between them. They judged that Aliates should give his daughter Arienus to Astyages, son of Cyaraxes, for without strong constraint agreements will not keep their force. These nations make sworn compacts as do the Greeks, and besides, when they cut the skin of their arms, they lick each other's blood. Cyrus had subjugated this Astyages then, Cyrus' own mother's father, for the reason which I shall presently disclose. Having this reason to quarrel with Cyrus, Croesus sent to ask the oracles if he should march against the Persians, 
and when a deceptive answer came he thought it to be favourable to him and so led his army into the persian territory when he came to the river halys he transported his army across it by the bridges which were there then as i maintain but the general belief of the greeks is that thales of miletus got the army across the story is that as croesus did not know how his army could pass the river as the aforesaid bridges did not yet exist then thales who was in the encampment made the river which flowed on the left of the army also flow on the right in the following way starting from a point on the river upstream from the camp he dug a deep semicircular trench so that the stream turned from its ancient course would flow in the trench to the rear of the camp and passing it would issue into its former bed with the result that as soon as the river was thus divided into two both channels could be forded some even say that the ancient channel dried up altogether but i do not believe this for in that case how did they pass the river when they were returning passing over with his army croesus then came to the part of cappadocia called pteria it is the strongest part of this country and lies on the line of the city of sinope on the euxine sea where he encamped and devastated the farms of the syrians and he took and enslaved the city of the tyrians and took all the places around it also and drove the syrians from their homes though they had done him no harm cyrus mustering his army advanced to oppose croesus gathering to him all those who lived along the way but before beginning his march he sent heralds to the ionians to try to draw them away from croesus the ionians would not be prevailed on but when cyrus arrived and encamped face to face with croesus there in the pterian country the armies had a trial of strength the fighting was fierce many on both sides fell and at nightfall they disengaged with neither side victorious the two sides contended thus croesus was not content with the size of his force for his army that had engaged was far smaller than that of cyrus therefore when on the day after the battle cyrus did not try attacking again he marched away to sardis intending to summon the egyptians in accordance with their treaty for before making an alliance with the lacedaemonians he had made one also with amasis king of egypt and to send for the babylonians also for with these two he had made an alliance labinetus at this time being their sovereign and to summon the lacedaemonians to join him at a fixed time he had in mind to muster all these forces and assemble his own army then to wait until the winter was over and march against the persians at the beginning of spring with such an intention as soon as he returned to sardis he sent heralds to all his allies summoning them to assemble at sardis in five months time and as for the soldiers whom he had with him who had fought with the persians all of them who were mercenaries he discharged never thinking that after a contest so equal cyrus would march against sardis this was how croesus reasoned meanwhile snakes began to swarm in the outer part of the city and when they appeared the horses leaving their accustomed pasture devoured them when croesus saw this he thought it a portent and so it was he at once sent to the homes of the Telmessian interpreters to inquire concerning it. But though his messengers came and learned from the Telmessians what the portent meant, they could not bring back word to Croesus, for he was a prisoner before they could make their voyage back to Sardis. Nonetheless, this was the judgment of the Telmessians, that Croesus must expect a foreign army to attack his country, and that when it came it would subjugate the inhabitants of the land for the snake they said was the offspring of the land 
but the horse was an enemy and a foreigner. This was the answer which the Telmessians gave Croesus, knowing as yet nothing of the fate of Sardis and of the king himself. But when they gave it, Croesus was already taken. End of Book One, Part Four Recording by Graham Redman Book One, Part Five of Herodotus Histories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Graham Redman. Histories, Volume One by Herodotus of Halicarnassus, translated by A. D. Godley. Book One, Part Five, Paragraphs seventy nine to ninety three. When Croesus marched away after the battle in the Pterian country, Cyrus, learning that Croesus had gone intending to disband his army, deliberated and perceived that it would be opportune for him to march quickly against Sardis before the power of the Lydians could be assembled again. This he decided, and this he did immediately. He marched his army into Lydia, and so came himself to bring the news of it to Croesus. All had turned out contrary to Croesus' expectation, and he was in a great quandary. Nevertheless, he led out the Lydians to battle. Now at this time there was no nation in Asia more valiant or warlike than the Lydian. It was their custom to fight on horseback, carrying long spears, and they were skilful at managing horses. So the armies met in the plain, wide and bare, that is before the city of Sardis. The Hillus and other rivers flow across it, and run violently together into the greatest of them, which is called Hermus. This flows from the mountain sacred to the mother Dindimini, and empties into the sea near the city of Phocea. When Cyrus saw the Lydians manoeuvring their battle lines here, he was afraid of their cavalry, and therefore at the urging of one Harpagus, a Mede, he did as I shall describe. Assembling all the camels that followed his army bearing food and baggage, he took off their burdens, and mounted men upon them equipped like cavalrymen. Having equipped them, he ordered them to advance before his army against Croesus' cavalry. He directed the infantry to follow the camels, and placed all his cavalry behind the infantry. When they were all in order, he commanded them to kill all the other Lydians who came in their way, and spare none, but not to kill Croesus himself, even if he should defend himself against capture. Such was his command. The reason for his posting the camels to face the cavalry was this. Horses fear camels, and can endure neither the sight nor the smell of them. This, then, was the intention of his manoeuvre, that Croesus' cavalry, on which the Lydian relied to distinguish himself, might be of no use. So when battle was joined, as soon as the horses smelled and saw the camels, they turned to flight, and all Croesus' hope was lost. Nevertheless the Lydians were no cowards. When they saw what was happening, they leaped from their horses and fought the Persians on foot. Many of both armies fell. At length the Lydians were routed and driven within their city wall, where they were besieged by the Persians. So then they were besieged. But Croesus, supposing that the siege would last a long time, again sent messengers from the city to his allies. Whereas the former envoys had been sent to summon them to muster at Sardis in five months' time, these were to announce that Croesus was besieged, and to plead for help as quickly as possible. So he sent to the Lacedaemonians, as well as to the rest of the allies. 
Now at this very time the Spartans themselves were feuding with the Argives over the country called Thyrii, for this was a part of the Argive territory which the Lacedaemonians had cut off and occupied. All the land towards the west as far as Malia belonged then to the Argives, and not only the mainland, but the island of Cythera and the other islands. The Argives came out to save their territory from being cut off. Then, after debate, the two armies agreed that three hundred of each side should fight, and whichever party won would possess the land. The rest of each army was to go away to its own country and not be present at the battle, since if the armies remained on the field, the men of either party might render assistance to their comrades if they saw them losing. Having agreed, the armies drew off, and picked men of each side remained and fought. Neither could gain advantage in the battle. At last only three out of the six hundred were left, Alcina and Chromius of the Argives, Othryades of the Lacedaemonians. These three were left alive at nightfall. Then the two Argives, believing themselves victors, ran to Argos. But Othryades the Lacedaemonian, after stripping the Argive dead and taking the arms to his camp, waited at his position. On the second day both armies came to learn the issue. For a while both claimed the victory, the Argives arguing that more of their men had survived, the Lacedaemonians showing that the Argives had fled, while their man had stood his ground and stripped the enemy dead. At last from arguing they fell to fighting. Many of both sides fell, but the Lacedaemonians gained the victory. The Argives, who before had worn their hair long by fixed custom, shaved their heads ever after, and made a law, with a curse added to it, that no Argive grow his hair, and no Argive woman wear gold, until they recovered Thyrii. And the Lacedaemonians made a contrary law, that they wear their hair long ever after, for until now they had not worn it so. Othryades, the lone survivor of the three hundred, was ashamed, it is said, to return to Sparta after all the men of his company had been killed, and killed himself on the spot at Thyrii. The Sardian herald came after this had happened to the Spartans to ask for their help for Croesus, now besieged. Nonetheless, when they heard the herald, they prepared to send help but when they were already equipped and their ships ready, a second message came that the fortification of the Lydians was taken and Croesus a prisoner. Then, though very sorry indeed, they ceased their efforts. This is how Sardis was taken. When Croesus had been besieged for fourteen days, Cyrus sent horsemen around in his army to promise to reward whoever first mounted the wall. After this the army made an assault, but with no success. Then, when all the others were stopped, a certain Mardian called Hyroeades attempted to mount by a part of the Acropolis where no guard had been set, since no one feared that it could be taken by an attack made here for here the height on which the Acropolis stood is sheer, and unlikely to be assaulted. This was the only place where Meles, the former king of Sardis, had not carried the lion which his concubine had borne him, the Telmessians having declared that if this lion were carried around the walls, Sardis could never be taken. Meles then carried the lion around the rest of the wall of the Acropolis, where it could be assaulted, but neglected this place because the height was sheer and defied attack. It is on the side of the city which faces towards Tumolus. The day before then, Hyroeades, this Mardian, had seen one of the Lydians come down by this part of the Acropolis after a helmet that had fallen down and fetch it. He took note of this and considered it and now he climbed up himself and other Persians after him. Many ascended, 
and thus Sardis was taken, and all the city sacked. I will now relate what happened to Croesus himself. He had a son, whom I have already mentioned, fine in other respects, but mute. Now in his days of prosperity past, Croesus had done all that he could for his son, and besides resorting to other devices, he had sent to Delphi to inquire of the oracle concerning him. The Pythian priestess answered him thus, Lydian, king of many, greatly foolish Croesus, wish not to hear in the palace the voice often prayed for of your son speaking. It were better for you that he remain mute as before, for on an unlucky day shall he first speak. So at the taking of the fortification a certain Persian, not knowing who Croesus was, came at him, meaning to kill him. Croesus saw him coming, but because of the imminent disaster he was past caring, and it made no difference to him whether he was struck and killed. But this mute son, when he saw the Persian coming on, in fear and distress broke into speech and cried, Man, do not kill Croesus! This was the first word he uttered, and after that, for all the rest of his life, he had power of speech. The Persians gained Sardis, and took Croesus prisoner. Croesus had ruled fourteen years, and been besieged fourteen days. Fulfilling the oracle, he had destroyed his own great empire. The Persians took him and brought him to Cyrus, who erected a pyre, and mounted Croesus atop it, bound in chains, with twice seven sons of the Lydians beside him. Cyrus may have intended to sacrifice him as a victory offering to some god, or he may have wished to fulfil a vow, or perhaps he had heard that Croesus was pious, and put him atop the pyre to find out if some divinity would deliver him from being burned alive. So Cyrus did this. As Croesus stood on the pyre, even though he was in such a wretched position, it occurred to him that Solon had spoken with God's help when he had said that no one among the living is fortunate. When this occurred to him, he heaved a deep sigh, and groaned aloud after long silence, calling out three times the name Solon. Cyrus heard, and ordered the interpreters to ask Croesus who he was invoking. They approached and asked, but Croesus kept quiet at their questioning, until finally they forced him, and he said, I would prefer to great wealth his coming into discourse with all despots. Since what he said was unintelligible, they again asked what he had said, persistently harassing him. He explained that first Solon the Athenian had come and seen all his fortune, and spoken as if he despised it. Now everything had turned out for him as Solon had said, speaking no more of him than of every human being, especially those who think themselves fortunate. While Croesus was relating all this, the pyre had been lit, and the edges were on fire. When Cyrus heard from the interpreters what Croesus said, he relented, and considered that he, a human being, was burning alive another human being, one his equal in good fortune. In addition, he feared retribution, reflecting how there is nothing stable in human affairs. He ordered that the blazing fire be extinguished as quickly as possible, and that Croesus and those with him be taken down. But despite their efforts, they could not master the fire. Then the Lydians say that Croesus understood Cyrus' change of heart, and when he saw every one trying to extinguish the fire but unable to check it, he invoked Apollo crying out that if Apollo had ever been given any pleasing gift by him, let him offer help and deliver him from the present evil. Thus he in tears invoked the god, 
and suddenly out of a clear and windless sky clouds gathered, a storm broke, and it rained violently, extinguishing the pyre. Thus Cyrus perceived that Croesus was dear to God, and a good man. He had him brought down from the pyre, and asked, Croesus, what man persuaded you to wage war against my land, and become my enemy instead of my friend? He replied, O king, I acted thus for your good fortune, but for my own ill fortune. The god of the Hellenes is responsible for these things, inciting me to wage war. No one is so foolish as to choose war over peace. In peace sons bury their fathers, in war fathers bury their sons. But I suppose it was dear to the divinity that this be so. Croesus said this, and Cyrus freed him, and made him sit near, and was very considerate to him, and both he and all that were with him were astonished when they looked at Croesus. He, for his part, was silent, deep in thought. Presently he turned and said, for he saw the Persians sacking the city of the Lydians, O king, am I to say to you what is in my mind now, or keep silent? When Cyrus urged him to speak up boldly, Croesus asked, The multitude there, what is it at which they are so busily engaged? They are plundering your city said Cyrus, and carrying off your possessions. No, Croesus answered, not my city, and not my possessions, for I no longer have any share of all this. It is your wealth that they are pillaging. Cyrus thought about what Croesus had said, and, telling the rest to withdraw, asked Croesus what fault he saw in what was being done. Since the gods have made me your slave, replied the Lydian, it is right that if I have any further insight I should point it out to you. The Persians, being by nature violent men, are poor, so if you let them seize and hold great possessions, you may expect that he who has got most will revolt against you. Therefore do this, if you like what I say. Have men of your guard watch all the gates. Let them take the spoil from those who are carrying it out, and say that it must be paid as a tithe to Zeus. Thus you shall not be hated by them for taking their wealth by force, and they, recognizing that you act justly, will give up the spoil willingly. When Cyrus heard this, he was exceedingly pleased, for he believed the advice good, and praising him greatly, and telling his guard to act as Croesus had advised, he said, Croesus, now that you, a king, are determined to act and to speak with integrity, ask me directly for whatever favour you like. Master, said Croesus, you will most gratify me if you will let me send these chains of mine to that god of the Greeks whom I especially honoured, and to ask him if it is his way to deceive those who serve him well. When Cyrus asked him what grudge against the god led him to make this request, Croesus repeated to him the story of all his own aspirations and the answers of the oracles, and more particularly his offerings, and how the oracle had encouraged him to attack the Persians, and so saying he once more insistently pled that he be allowed to reproach the god for this. At this Cyrus smiled and replied, This I will grant you, Croesus, and whatever other favour you may ever ask me. When Croesus heard this, he sent Lydians to Delphi, telling them to lay his chains on the doorstep of the temple, and to ask the god if he were not ashamed to have persuaded Croesus to attack the Persians, telling him that he would destroy Cyrus's power, of which power, they were to say, showing the chains, these were the first fruits. They should ask this, and further, if it were the way of the Greek gods to be ungrateful. When the Lydians came and spoke as they had been instructed, the priestess, it is said, made the following reply. 
No one may escape his lot, not even a god. Croesus has paid for the sin of his ancestor of the fifth generation before, who was led by the guile of a woman to kill his master, though he was one of the guard of the Heraclidae, and who took to himself the royal state of that master to which he had no right. And it was the wish of Loxias that the evil lot of Sardis fall in the lifetime of Croesus' sons, not in his own. But he could not deflect the fates. Yet, as far as they gave in, he did accomplish his wish and favour Croesus, for he delayed the taking of Sardis for three years. And let Croesus know this, that although he is now taken, it is by so many years later than the destined hour. And further, Loxias saved Croesus from burning. But as to the oracle that was given to him, Croesus is wrong to complain concerning it. For Loxias declared to him that if he led an army against the Persians, he would destroy a great empire. Therefore he ought, if he had wanted to plan well, to have sent and asked whether the god spoke of Croesus or of Cyrus' empire. But he did not understand what was spoken, or make further inquiry, for which now let him blame himself. When he asked that last question of the oracle, and Loxias gave him that answer concerning the mule, even that Croesus did not understand. For that mule was in fact Cyrus, who was the son of two parents not of the same people, of whom the mother was better and the father inferior, for she was a Mede and the daughter of Astyages king of the Medes, but he was a Persian and a subject of the Medes, and although in all respects her inferior, he married this lady of his. This was the answer of the priestess to the Lydians. They carried it to Sardis, and told Croesus, and when he heard it, he confessed that the sin was not the gods, but his. And this is the story of Croesus' rule, and of the first overthrow of Ionia. There are many offerings of Croesus in Hellas, and not only those of which I have spoken. There is a golden tripod at Thebes in Boeotia, which he dedicated to Apollo of Ismenus. At Ephesus there are the oxen of gold, and the greater part of the pillars. And in the temple of Pronia at Delphi, a golden shield. All these survived to my lifetime, but other of the offerings were destroyed. And the offerings of Croesus at Brancidae of the Milesians, as I learn by inquiry, are equal in weight and like those at Delphi. Those which he dedicated at Delphi and the shrine of Amphiarius were his own, the first fruits of the wealth inherited from his father. The rest came from the estate of an enemy who had headed a faction against Croesus before he became king, and conspired to win the throne of Lydia for Pantaleon. This Pantaleon was a son of Aliates and half-brother of Croesus. Croesus was Aliates' son by a Carian, and Pantaleon by an Ionian mother. So when Croesus gained the sovereignty by his father's gift, he put the man who had conspired against him to death by drawing him across a carding comb, and first confiscated his estate, then dedicated it as and where I have said. This is all that I shall say of Croesus' offerings. There are not many marvellous things in Lydia to record in comparison with other countries, except the gold dust that comes down from Tmolus. But there is one building to be seen there which is much the greatest of all, except those of Egypt and Babylon. In Lydia is the tomb of Aliates, the father of Croesus, the base of which is made of great stones, and the rest of it of mounded earth. It was built by the men of the market, and the craftsmen, and the prostitutes. There survived until my time five cornerstones set on the top of the tomb, and in these was cut the record of the work done by each group, and measurement showed that the prostitute's share of the work was the greatest. 
all the daughters of the common people of Lydia ply the trade of prostitutes to collect dowries until they can get themselves husbands, and they themselves offer themselves in marriage. Now this tomb has a circumference of thirteen hundred and ninety yards, and its breadth is above four hundred and forty yards, and there is a great lake hard by the tomb which, the Lydians say, is fed by ever-flowing springs. It is called the Gygean Lake. Such, then, is this tomb. End of Book One, Part Five Recording by Graham Redman.